Transgender Inclusion in the Fight Against Oppression and the Search for Equality. Hi, my name is Asa. That wasn't always my name. In fact, I've only been using it for about a year now. Before that, for about 15 years, people called me Nathaniel or Nate. And even before that, people called me Natalie or Nat. So basically, I'm AFAB. It's okay if you don't know what that is. I'm going to explain it to you. I didn't know that an acronym until recently either. I had to look it up myself. AFAB means assigned female at birth, as opposed to AMAB, assigned male at birth. I think these are more accurate terms to use to describe a certain aspect of the transgendered experience. Generally, those of us who transition from what people assume is our birth gender to the gender that we appear to be now. I started testosterone in 1999 at the age of 27. I had top surgery in 2000. Basically, top surgery is the removal of my female appearing breasts. I've had no other surgeries. I have no plans for other surgeries. The reasons for that are manifold, and they are highly personal. Every single trans person has to make a decision on how far they want to transition. That does not mean they are any less male or any less female than any other trans person. When I first started transitioning, I put together a video showing the changes that testosterone had made on my body. The pictures that you're about to see are from my childhood all the way up to about 2011. In 2011, the National Center for Transgender Equality released the most thorough survey of our community. It's not easy to be a trans person in today's culture. It is literally deadly. 
the NCTE put together the statistics, not only of those of us who are murdered, but those of us who attempt suicide, as well as some very dire statistics regarding health care, housing, employment, and relationship statuses. It painted a picture of widespread discrimination and bias. It's time for this to stop. Veterans of our armed forces suffering from diagnosed clinical depression have a suicide attempt rate of about 3%. And the Army calls it a national epidemic. They are jumping through hoops trying to help trying to keep these young men and women from killing themselves. In our community, that rate is 41%. And I believe it's higher. I believe it's more than 50%. I personally don't know any trans person who has not at one point in their life seriously thought about taking their own life. We can't know how many succeed because we can't ask them. And often in death, we are misgendered. This is Blake Brockington. He was a student at the University of North Carolina. He was the first out and proud transman in his North Carolina high school. He became homecoming king in his senior year. He was a fearless activist. And he was looked up to by a lot of young transmen. He was a hero. I felt like I've lived my entire life as a lie. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, in a Southern Baptist home. I've always been kind of different, and it was always a bad thing in my family, but they never really said anything. And then when the homecoming stuff happened, it was, they were like, you're still not a guy to us, like guys and girls, you know? And um, it's, it's been really hard. High school's been really hard. To me personally, it made me feel like for once I could just be a normal teenage boy. Just a normal teenage boy, just doing normal teenage guy things. Like being homecoming king, that's a normal teenage boy thing. We all want to do it, kind of, sometimes. <laughs> Not many weeks go by where I don't hear of some trans person either being murdered or killing themselves. Why do we want to kill ourselves? There's got to be something that's mental about us, right? One of the ways I deal with my own depression is through artwork, through creation, through physical activity. But even then, sometimes it's not enough. This picture down here, on the far right, with me with a cigarette in my mouth, is the last time that I seriously contemplated taking my own life. That was in November of 2014. It was very cold, something like five degrees that day, and I was standing on the roof of my girlfriend's apartment. I made the decision that what I was going through at that particular time was not going to be the thing to take me out. Most days, I'm very happy about that. Today, I'm happy about that. Being transgendered is not a mental illness. Yet, from the beginning of most of our lives, we are told that we are crazy, wrong, sick, sinful, delusional, and all manners of unfit for society. We are thrown out of our homes, and our families disown us. Our society marginalizes us at every turn. We are denied jobs, housing, bathroom use, and it's perfectly legal to discriminate us in almost every single state. Struggling with depression is a natural effect of a daily assault upon our very right to exist. Because we understand biology a lot better now, and we understand 
the function of dysphoria now. The APA has removed transgenderism as a mental illness from the DSMV-5. What does remain is a helpful diagnosis referring to gender dysphoria and the depression that occurs due to the way that our culture marginalizes us. This isn't about anything that's innate in our brains that causes this disorder. The disorder is caused by the way society treats us from the time we start being gender non-conforming, which for most of us is as soon as we can start to express ourselves with words and actions. To reiterate, the distress that accompanies gender dysphoria arises as a result of a culture that stigmatizes people who do not conform to gender norms. That's what Robin Rosenberg, the clinical psychologist, co-author of the psychology textbook Abnormal Psychology, wrote. The scientific and biological evidence points to the fact that biological sex itself is not binary. This doesn't just happen among humans, it happens among almost every single mammalian species we observe. There are more than just XX or XY configurations. A plethora of things can happen. It also appears that many sex characteristics may not even be located genetically on the X or Y chromosomes. Being transgendered is a biological reality. One of my cyber friends, Andrew Rubin, put together one of the most definitive lists I've ever seen on all of the current research papers and studies out there. If you'd like to take a look and read all these for yourself, the link is right there for you. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if someone believes that being transgendered is a mental illness, or if someone understands that being transgendered is a medical fact. No matter what you believe about those of us who are transgendered, there is no excuse to treat anyone as subhuman. But here's the stark reality. We don't need to kill ourselves because other people are doing that job for us. In 2015, the number of trans people murdered in the U.S. alone was at a historic high. The number is probably actually higher. This number is only the ones who are met a specific criteria of being targeted for the sole reason of the trans status. And in order for that to happen, it's classified as a hate crime in most places. Other trans people who have been murdered have not been included on this because maybe they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe it wasn't because they were trans. And assaults that don't result in murder haven't been counted. The NTCE survey records 78% of respondents as victims of harassment in K-12 schools. 35% reports physical assault. 50% report harassment in the workplace. The last time I was physically assaulted, it was in February. And while I can't say for sure it was because I was trans, this individual did know that, I am pretty certain that had I been a cis male, this person would not have attempted to engage me in the way in which he did that led to him attacking me from behind and giving me a concussion that kept me out of work for two weeks. I wrote this song and did this video for the people of 2015 who were specifically targeted and murdered for being trans. Unfortunately, I could not get a good picture of all of them, and one of them, I could not even find one picture. Her name is still there, and her cause of death.
What is behind all this vitriol? Why are we cut down? Why are we stepped upon? Why are we made to feel less than human? Where it's okay to make fun of us? To murder us? And to torture us? I think there are many things that cause the fear, that causes the hate towards us. I think one of the biggest things is that we threaten the core of identity. And what I really mean is that we challenge masculinity. There's got to be something wrong with a man who cuts off his penis and wants to be a woman. He has to be dangerous. He must want to rape my wife and daughter. Of course I understand why a woman would want to be a man. It's great to be a man. She wants to get all of the strength that we have. But she's not really a man. She's just taking steroids. I should remind her she's a woman. It comes down to our collective social illness and dealing with all things sexual. But the justifications for hating us are very old. And they're used over and over again when trying to oppress segments of humanity. The Frederick Douglass Institute of Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania sponsored this presentation in April of 2016. The parallels between his struggles and our struggles are profound. Tell me if you've heard this one. Senator Benjamin Tillman on the Senate floor in 1900. We have never believed him to be equal to the white man, and we will not submit to his gratifying his lusts on our wives and daughters without lynching him. Have you listened to the current fear over us trans people using the bathrooms? They're saying the exact same things. We must protect our wives and daughters from these perverts, from these men who will gratify their lust on our wives and daughters. And if I see them in there, I will shoot them. I will kill them. I will string them up. I have seen and heard these things via social media, the news outlets, and my friends' posts. When I say our friends' posts, I don't necessarily mean that our friends are saying horrible things. Although, it has happened, and long-term relationships have suffered. What I mean, though, is generally our friends have to stick up for us, too. The very nature of being trans means that we put our friends and our families in the limelight, if they are part of our lives. They have to stand up with us. This was taken from one of my best friend's pages. I want to talk about all the things that are wrong with what her friend was saying in this particular piece. The comment to my friend about this, if I'm in there with a transgender person and don't realize it, it's because a transgender person has made the effort to not stand out, and I appreciate that. As if it is our job as human beings to make sure that we are totally acceptable to everyone else out there, to make sure we pass well enough, that we are masculine enough or feminine enough for their own comfort level. While she acknowledges there may not be any evidence of problems now, because there's never been evidence of problems of trans people using the gendered bathroom that they identify with, but she just can't risk on the small off chance because this is some grand experiment. Once again, the underlying tone is that if we have to exist, we need to look the part. And if we don't, then we don't want to know about you. And if we do, then you're clearly a risk to my safety and my daughter's safety.
And this is the thing. Whether we're in the closet or out of the closet, whether we pass or don't pass, we're at risk. There's a persistent and real threat of violence. If I pass and get a job, it is legal if they find out that I'm trans, which they will, eventually, of me losing that job, finding lovers and partners can be difficult because of the stigma. If you get sick and go to the hospital, it's one of the greatest places of discrimination. I've experienced this personally on almost every single time I've had to go to the hospital. The last time I was severely dehydrated, I had been sick for about two weeks. While I was in the ER, I had no less than 15 people coming in to check out the tranny. The phlebotomist, whose sole job it is to stick me and draw blood, took five sticks to get a vein because she was shaking so much and so nervous. I had to sit there and calm her down. I had to tell her that I wouldn't bite her, that it would be okay to take a breath. I'm there for help, and yet I'm in a place where I again have to educate. It gets old. It gets very old. And then we are very aware of the toll it takes upon our allies. Our families have to explain us to their friends and families. Our friends, their sexuality, their own gender identity, everything about them is in question because of us. It doesn't let up. We have to have conversations every single day if we're out of the closet or we're not stealth. And if we are in, we have to deny so much of our past experience. You have to lie about who your college roommates are. Possibly lie about what sports you played in high school and college. You're always afraid someone from before will out you. And in a moment's notice, your entire life that you've built for yourself since transitioning can come crashing down. It's happened over and over and over again. The greater LGB community has historically not been conducive to helping us. The human rights campaign sold us under the bus. They're doing a lot better job now, but they left us behind in the search for equality that our gay and lesbian and bisexual brothers and sisters have been able to have. The trans-exclusionary radical feminist group has kept trans women out of what they define as women-only spaces, denying their femininity. And they are less than kind to trans men, seeing us as sellouts, as also, once again, not men but women who have been confused. We've been shunned in the past from LGB spaces. There's a unique solitude of being trans that does not exist for almost any other marginalized group. There really aren't that many of us. And in any given state or any given town, you may know of one person. Thankfully, we have the internet now and we can reach out to each other, but this wasn't always the case. When I was transitioning, I had to drive two hours one way for a therapist and two hours the other way for a doctor. Still finding doctors in this area where I live is difficult. I'm fortunate. I have people who advocate for me. Not all of us do. And the only thing that us trans people have in common with other trans people is our transness. And so when you're talking about trying to build friends, we come from different religious upbringings, different classes, different socioeconomic constructs, different belief structures. 
We have different hobbies, totally different cultures. The only thing that we have in common is being trans. It's not conducive to developing a deeper sense of community, mostly because we are so far geographically separated from each other as well. We don't grow up with other trans people. It's hard to meet other trans people. The feeling of being alone is poignant, deep, and very real. There is hope. Things are getting better. 20 years has changed much. Information and treatment is more available. Communities are forming, and allies are joining the fight. The more people like me talk out, the more everyone else knows someone who is trans. And it's a relationship that will change minds and hearts. Talking about it will change minds and hearts. Letting people see that we are people will change minds and hearts. For positive and negative, we are becoming more visible. The trans community is not one large thing. We are made up of many different kinds of individuals. My trans experience, while we'll have similarities with other people, is not the same as other people's trans experience. Chaz Bono's experience is not my experience. Neither is Laverna Cox. We have similarities. Caitlyn Jenner's experience is unlike almost every other trans person's experience. But it is still a trans experience. Get to know us individually. We are just as diverse as every single other person on this planet. We are finding our voices. We are standing up. We are not remaining silent anymore. We are becoming more powerful. We are holding positions, revered positions, in government, in industry, in medicine, in science, in all avenues of human endeavors. You will see us. You will know us. If we all join together, every movement that is looking to elevate humanity to a place of compassion and empathy, a place where we're all treated equally, any civil or human rights movement that ignores any segment of the population that suffers under the heel of oppression is guilty of the oppression they seek to end. Let's stop oppressing each other. Let's lift each other up. Let's walk together, side by side. I'll end with a quote from Frederick Douglass. Right is of no sex. Truth is of no color. God is a father of us all, and we are all brethren. We are all brethren. <laughs>